Okay. Uh, is it okay? Can you see it? Yes. Okay. So uh, I'm going to talk uh, about genetic uh, genetics as a documentation uh, or an archive uh, still to 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 explore. Uh, I'm going to start with uh, some basic notions of uh, genetics, about uh, population genetics. And then, uh, as I do believe that most of you are uh, well aware of the Portuguese Jewish history, I'm just going to do a short uh, historical contextualization of my work. And then I'll show you the results for the male and female lineages, like chromosome and mitochondrial DNA. And finally, the present and uh, future work. So um, when we talk about uh, human beings as a species, as a biological species, uh, we are the result of uh, uh, millions of years of evolution. And uh, nothing in biology makes sense except uh, in the light of um, evolution. Also, nothing in evolution makes sense uh, except in the light of population genetics. So let's talk about uh, population genetics. Uh, here we study the uh, genetic composition uh, of populations, uh, meaning uh, its genetic differences or variation, which uh, originally uh, results from uh, mutation events. I will explain later what that means. Uh, and also recombination from one generation to the next, uh, which is then shaped by selection, uh, mating strategies, uh, random drift, and uh, gene flow. Gene flow means uh, the, um, the admixture between uh, different populations. So basically, when we talk about population genetics, we, we basically study the differences uh, in a... Uh, in, um, in, uh, in terms of frequencies of a particular uh, characteristic. And we do know that these differences are much higher within a specific population than between completely different populations. Uh, therefore, uh, we should not expect uh, population genetics uh, to define a set of exclusive and defining uh, characteristics to a particular uh, group. This means that there is no such thing as uh, a Jewish uh, genetic identity or, uh, or Buddhist or Christian or uh, whatever. There is no such uh, genetic uh, ID, let's say, identity card. Because um, we are always talking about frequencies and differences in, uh, in those uh, frequencies. Um, and how can we assess this, this genetic diversity? Well, uh, inside each one of us, uh, we have thousands of different cells and inside the cell, there's this portion here called the nucleus. And inside the nucleus, you have chromosomes. Each of these chromosomes uh, is made of uh, a DNA molecule. And this molecule uh, is made of different four different letters oops sorry um a c uh, a g c and t so basically all our genetic information uh, is written uh, with different combinations and sequences of these uh, four letters so uh when i'm talking about an archive uh, the kind of archive we study uh, would be something like this uh, a sequence of many uh, of these letters that will give us uh, all the information about uh, a particular individual. So uh, when we talk about the, the, the human genome, meaning the whole genetic information that each one of us uh, carries, uh, we can talk about what we call the recombining genome that includes the autosomes and the X chromosome and also the non-recombining genome. Non-recombining means that there is no, um, there is no reshuffling, there is no uh, recombination, uh, which is represented by the Y chromosome and the mitochondrial DNA. Each 
uh, each one of these genomic uh, compartments have specific uh, features, like for instance, the, uh, the mutation rate, some of them are very low, some of them are very high, uh, meaning that they can accumulate a lot of different mutations. They also have a very different uh, pattern of transmission from, from parents to the offspring. And so each one of these genomic compartments can give, uh, can give us uh, different, um, different answers uh, depending on what kind of questions, uh, meaning uh, anthropological or historical questions, we are trying to, to answer uh, using genetic tools. So uh, each one of us has uh, in its cells inside the nucleus 46 chromosomes. Uh, each pair of these chromosomes, uh, one of the pair has a paternal uh, origin and the other one has a maternal origin. We also have the uh, one last pair, which is called the um, sex chromosomes, that will define if we are uh, a man or a woman. For a woman, we will have two uh, X chromosomes, while a man will have an X chromosome and also a Y chromosome. Only so, only the males have uh, one um, Y chromosome. Besides this uh, so-called nuclear genome, because it's located in the nucleus of the cell, which is this part here, we also have an external uh, DNA, which is called the mitochondrial DNA. Uh, this is a, a circular molecule with a, very, uh, with a very high mutation rate here in this part, in this blue part, it's called the control region, and all, all the rest Basically, it's called the coding region that codes for, for, for different genes. So all the rest of the, uh, our chromosomes, the, the called the recombining genome, uh, they do reshuffle when they are transmitted from father or mother to son, meaning that there is a, a, a mixture between these two different uh, genetics one from the mother, one from the father. But a different thing happens when we are talking about the Y chromosome. Uh, as, as we saw, the, the Y chromosome only exists in, in males and it's only transmitted from father to sons. So for instance, uh, in this couple here, it's transmitted to this son or here. Here, what happens is that, sorry, here, what happens is because this couple only had a daughter, this Y chromosome lineage is lost and couldn't make it to the present day. So only when you have a direct line from father to son, you can explore um, this, this ancestry of the present lineage uh, you can find. Uh, and this lineage can go back thousands of years uh, back just like in genealogy. Uh, with mitochondrial DNA, a similar thing happens. Only here, uh, only the mother can pass it uh, both to sons and daughters, but only the daughters will pass it to the next generation. Meaning, for instance, uh, if a couple just has one son, this mitochondrial, this female lineage is lost. and. Uh, can't can make it to the present day. Again, only when you have a direct line from mother to daughter, we can establish these this female uh, lineages. Um, when we are talking about this transmission of uh, genetic material, sometimes uh, when this genetic heritage is passed down to the, to the offspring, uh, sometimes small uh, kind of errors uh, happened um, in, in the sequence, uh, and we call that uh, mutations. And as we saw also before, mutations are the, the, the source of all evolution. To uh, illustrate this with, uh, in, a, in an easy way, I think, I'm going to show you uh, an English text. Uh, and uh, if, I, if I change some letters in a, in a, in a text, uh, it will become something different. 
just like in genetics. Actually, this test was uh, from uh, before the Brexit, but because uh, the mechanism is exactly the same, I'm going to show it to you. I'm not going to read all the sentences, but just for you to have an idea uh, how uh, a process of mutations uh, and new lineages can appear genetically, just with a change of some letters in the genetic code. So uh, the European Commission has just announced an agreement whereby English will be official, uh, the official language of the European Union rather than German, which was the other possibility. As part of the negotiations, the British government conceded that English spelling had some room for improvement and has accepted a five-year phasing plan that would become known as Euro-English. I'm going to skip now some, some sentences, okay? So, for instance, the last one. The hard C will be dropped in favor of K. This should clean up confusion and keyboards uh, can have one less letter. Uh, there will be growing public enthusiasm in the second year when the troublesome PH will be replaced by F. This will make words like photograph 20% shorter. So now let's skip to this one. Government will encourage the removal of double letters, which have always been the deterrent to accurate spelling. Also, all will agree that the horrible mess of the silent E in the language is disgraceful and it should go away. By the third year, people will be respective to steps such as rephrasing TH with Z and W with V. So now let's skip here. Uh, there will be no more trouble or difficulties and everyone will find it easy to understand each other. Uh, the dream of a united Europe will finally come true. And after the fifth year, we will all be speaking German like they wanted in the first place. So I think you can all get the message how we can change a text just by switching some letters. Except, uh, a very similar process happens in genetics when you have the genetic code and you change some letters. Sometimes you have another letter, sometimes you lose letters, sometimes you change, you replace one letter to the other, and all these differences will uh, create new variants and so new lineages from, uh, from the ancestral one. So after this, we can, uh, by studying these different uh, mutations, uh, we can construct uh, a phylogenetic tree, uh, in this case, for instance, for the, for the Y chromosome. For instance, uh, if I study a, a particular genetic uh, DNA sample, I will study the set of different mutations a particular individual has, and so I will classify him in a particular uh, Y chromosome lineage. This happens uh, exactly the same with the mitochondrial DNA. These lineages have a specific geographic distribution pattern. And so this will allow us to reconstruct uh, not only the origin where this lineage comes from, but also reconstruct uh, human uh, migration paths. And this happens just as well as the, for the Y chromosome, as well as for the mitochondrial DNA. So knowing uh, that how we could study uh, uh, a particular population using these genetic tools, um, I wanted to see how, how this, uh, this awareness of the people in my region, I'm from Ragansa, so uh, right here, the northeast corner of Portugal. Uh, so I wanted to find out if this awareness of Jewish ancestry could somehow be reflected in the, um, in the genetic makeup of these populations. So I collected samples, uh, DNA samples in, in, uh, in different places here. And now I'm going to talk just a little bit uh, of this, the Jewish history uh, here in my region. So in 
So uh, this document that you see here, this is a, a letter from the King uh, uh, Dinish to the Jews of Braganza, dating from 1279. Uh, 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 and in this letter, he, he actually gives a lot of um, positive, uh, he takes a lot of positive measures and benefits uh, for the Jews, uh, for the Jewish community uh, that was living here. So uh, this means that they had an organized and important Jewish community, uh, probably uh, before this, this, this year. Uh, most historians say probably at least from 1187, at least uh, from this time. Um, in, in 1496, uh, the King Dom Manuel I signed the decree of ex expulsion, uh, four years after the one issued uh, in Spain. And a year later, uh, in 1497, uh, around uh, 20,000 Jews were forcibly baptized. This was a strategy of King Dom Manuel uh, to tell the, the Catholic uh, Queen and King uh, that officially there were no more Jews in Portugal since they were all baptized. Uh, in 1536, the Inquisition was also established um, in Portugal, uh, 50 something years after uh, the establishment of the Inquisition in Spain. So obviously this led, all these persecutions led to uh, an exodus of the Jewish communities. For instance, here in these two maps, here you can see uh, in the 15th century, uh, there were uh, around 134 Jewish communities spread basically all over the country. Um, probably they were around 10% of the total Portuguese population. Uh, in the 17th century, they were reduced to 10,000. And basically in the 20th century, uh, all the Jews that once lived in the country were reduced to the crypto-Jewish centers in the northeast and, uh, and uh, centuries of, of Portugal. So um, the Inquisition and the distinction between old and new Christians was, was extinguished uh, in 1821 by the Marquês de Pombal. And so uh, we assist to the uh, resurgence of the Jewish communities. First, uh, here in, uh, this is the synagogue of Porto. Uh, and basically, uh, thanks to the, the work of Capitão Barros Vasto, who traveled to the northeast of Portugal and tried to gather all the uh, crypto Jews. So the Israeli community in Braganza was founded in, in 1927. Uh, but shortly after that, in 1934, uh, uh, the community was dissolved and basically all the families that once belonged to this com community just went back to their own places spread uh, in the region. Uh, here are some documents from uh, this, uh, from the synagogue here in Braganza. Here is the center of Braganza, the, the town. At the end of this street uh, is the house where uh, that worked as a synagogue. Uh, here is the castle of Braganza. Inside the walls, there was uh, a synagogue and also a Jewish quarter dating from the 13th, 14th century. Uh, but then it spread uh, along the, the hills here. And here is a perspective of one of the villages I went to collect samples, Arguzelo. Here, another, another village. This house was uh, also worked as a synagogue in a carcel. Uh, and these are, um, this is just, a, this is a typical uh, kitchen uh, wood bench, just, just like the one I have in there. Uh, it's traditional here in, uh, in Trazos Montes. And this one here, the, the owner, uh, who also gave me a DNA sample, carved uh, uh, a menorah. And uh, here, uh, it's another menorah from Vilarinho dos Galegos, another village. And so basically these are the historical, let's say the historical evidence of the, of the um, rich uh, Jewish past here in, uh, in my region. But for a population geneticist, uh, the real treasure is the people because the people are our archives because it's uh, inside each one of these people that you have all the genetic information. And so, 
I started to use the genetic tools to study uh, geneal genealogy uh, uh, in, a, in a work called, uh, that we can call uh, archaeogenetics, meaning uh, the application of genetic data uh, to solve historical and archaeological questions of, um, of our human past. So the results were published in, uh, in scientific papers. And now I'm going to talk just about the male and female um, lineages. So about the male lineages, we found uh, in, in the Braganza Jews and also in the Belmont Jews, uh, this three lineages have much higher frequencies than the same ones find uh, in the general non-Jewish population. Uh, I will talk about each one of them uh, after. Here you see the distribution of all different lineages we found in the Portuguese uh, Jews, in Belmont, and the general uh, non-Jewish uh, population. As you see, for instance, in Belmont, they have very low genetic diversity. Hello. You can only Hello. see just one. You can only see three different uh, lineages, while uh, here in the region in Braganza, the genetic diversity is much much higher. Uh, when we uh, calculate the genetic differences between our samples and other samples from other Jewish groups, particularly Sephardic Jews. Uh, they are genetically closer to these populations than to the non-Jewish general Portuguese population or uh, other Europeans. Uh, so basically for the Y chromosome, uh, this is what we found. For instance, for lineage J1, uh, this lineage has a, a Middle Eastern uh, origin and is linked with the, probably with the Phoenician migrations. So this could represent uh, uh, the, the heritage of the ancient, ancient Sephardic populations, uh, the first ones that came to Iberia. Uh, also, J2 has also a, 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 a Middle Eastern uh, origin geographically, and it's also very frequent in other Sephardic Jews. Uh, this one is a very rare um, lineage called T, um, and it's uh, uh, and it's interesting because uh, it reaches quite high frequencies only in Sephardic Jews. This one R1B is the most frequent lineage in the general Portuguese population. It has uh, a distribution along the Atlantic uh, uh, in England, Ireland. Uh, and so this could represent some, some degree of a mixture between the Jewish populations and the local um, population. Concerning the female lineages, we found uh, 11 uh, different lineages that you can see here. Uh, among these 11 lineages, we consider five of them, uh, HV0, B, and one, uh, T2D, T2E, and U2E as putative uh, Sephardic founding lineages because of the high frequency uh, that uh, we can find these lineages only among the, the, um, the Portuguese Jews and basically almost absent in, uh, in, um, in the general uh, non-Jewish uh, Portuguese population. Here again, it's the is the distribution of all these lineages in uh, in the northeast Portugal, also in the Jews of Belmont. Here also a very again, just like in for the male counterpart, a very uh, low diversity. This means that basically all the population of Jews you have now in Belmont, they all descend from two different uh, women. So this is what it means. Uh, so very, very low um, genetic diversity. Uh, here uh, is represented uh, our the, the lineage that we found for the mitochondrial DNA with all the different variants and mutations. But I'm going to show you like this because it's easier to, to visualize. For instance, for HV0B, uh, this means that the, the samples from, uh, from the Portuguese Jews in the northeast of Portugal in Braganza region uh, share a common ancestry with the female Jews in Belmont. 
meaning they they do have uh, the same uh, the same background uh, for another lineage uh, n1a and n1b uh, either uh, when we compare our samples with uh, with the general uh, databases uh, worldwide either we, we can't find any match at all meaning that they cluster just the, the samples from here or for instance here they cluster together with samples from uh, Zamora. Zamora it's a very small uh, it, it's a, not a small town it's a small uh, town like Braganza on the on the other side of the border in Spain and we do know that Zamora has a very rich uh, and well documented Jewish Jewish uh, past also so uh, this means that this individual could probably be a descendant of, um, of Sephardic Jews from Iberia, but uh, he just is not aware of, uh, of uh, her ancestry. Um, in another very interesting lineage, uh, this one T to B, again, we find a match with another sample from the same place in, in, uh, in Spain, just on the other side of the border. And especially this one here, T to E, this is a, a rather uncommon lineage, and it's very interesting because we found, uh, and we are talking about complete DNA, uh, mitochondrial DNA sequences, meaning uh, we are talking about a sequence of uh, uh, 16,569 letters, and they share exactly the same uh, with with um, with people in Poland, in the Czech Republic, in Lithuania, in the Netherlands, in Romania, and in Bulgaria, both uh, on Ashkenazi Jews and also Sephardic Jews. And um, some samples that we found also in Turkey, uh, Sephardic Jewish uh, Jews from Turkey, and Mexico and the USA. And also these, these samples here belong to people who know that they have Iberian ancestry. So probably they could also be descendants of Iberian Jews, but they, they are just not aware of that, uh, of that uh, ethnicity or uh, uh, let's say. So also, uh, I just found out there are uh, 10 more samples. I couldn't put it here because the samples are not yet published. Uh, but uh, uh, they are uh, still uh, private uh, samples. But I know that in Israel, they just found that they found 10 different samples, all Ashkenazi Jews that belong exactly to this same lineage that we, that we find in, uh, in Varganza, with just two different mutations, which is very, very interesting. But I couldn't show, uh, I, I can't show that because it's not yet published. So in the last, uh, in the last one, Again, uh, we only share a common ancestry with an Ashkenazi Jew from uh, Moldavia. So basically, these are the results for male and female lineages. We found definitely an ancestral genetic heritage with uh, uh, an origin in the Middle East. Also very high genetic diversities, uh, meaning that these communities were funded by, by different males and different females a number of them. Uh, also, probably they had a, a stable size in the community uh, and with constant uh, in integration of other Jewish uh, individuals rather than uh, non-Jewish Portuguese uh, or Spanish neighbors. Um, also, there are some of, uh, evidence of a mixture with the, with the non-Jewish population, both on the male side as well as on the female side. And uh, we also found that there is a greater genetic affinity between uh, this, this, um, this Portuguese Jewish descendants and other uh, Jewish individuals spread uh, all over the world. So um, just to finish the uh, presently, uh, I started a, a new project with Professor Karl Skorecki from the Varyolan University, and we are trying to construct uh, an Iberian Jewish reference population database uh, to fill in a gap in global Jewish uh, population genetic structure, because there isn't yet uh, a, a, a genetic um, database, a reliable one. 
Uh, so uh, since 2018, I started to collect samples in uh, all other regions in Portugal, in the community of Lisbon, in the community of Porto, uh, some more in the community of Belmont, and then other places with a well-known uh, Jewish historical past. So basically now these samples represent the people who stayed in Iberia after the decrees of expulsion. And by creating this database, uh, other, other populations that are now in the diaspora, uh, Iberian um, Sephardic Jews spread all over the world, they would be able to compare their own uh, genetic uh, heritage with these samples from here. So that's our, our goal to, to the next project. Basically, we have around 200 samples right now but we are still looking for fundings. So basically it's very frustrating because we have the samples and now we don't have the funds to analyze them. So if any of you is aware of, uh, of any institution uh, that I can apply for funds, please contact me. You have my email addresses here. Uh, and uh, thank you so much for uh, your, att uh, your attention. So I'll pass it now to David or Tom, thank you. Thank, thank you. Can I just um, make an observation because I can see that there's some members of my uh, synagogue here, Bevis Marx in London, that it should be possible because the uh, British uh, archives are so complete to trace back uh, from women who've arrived in our congregation as uh, Vindas uh, from Portugal to, to trace to their, their, their female line descendants today and perhaps that's uh, at some point when you have finance would be uh, would be a useful uh, and interesting that, that would definitely be very interesting yes i just <laughs> found out about these 10 samples uh, uh, in israel uh, they are not yet published uh, but it's very interesting they all belong to ashkenazi jews from the from uh, spread in the north of europe uh, which probably they have Sephardic ancestry, but they are just not aware of that or they just don't know. Because if you are comparing a, a, a full sequence of mitochondrial DNA uh, and they match exactly, they have exactly the same mutations, uh, uh, this means that they have a very, a rather recent uh, common uh, ancestor. Okay, can you define when? Because you, you were talking about the uh, T2E uh mitochondrial uh line and you mentioned poland the czech republic and lithuania can you can you estimate when those those lines sort of might have parted from the the lines that you found in portugal and elsewhere uh, right now no we didn't we didn't uh we didn't study that because the mitochondrial uh the mitochondrial molecule uh, as I explained, it has a, 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 a very variable region called the, the control region. Uh, and then the, the rest of the sequence is the coding region. And each for, portion of the, of the molecule has different uh, mutation rates. Meaning, usually, you, 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 uh, to, if you want to, to estimate uh, uh, um, uh, particular date or age, uh, y usually you what you use is the mutation rates of the different parts of the molecule, and it's very uh, it's very hard to to estimate a, a precise number because different mutations in the in the exact same molecule have different mutation rates. So, uh, I mean, if I can tell you like something like uh, it could be, for instance, uh, 500 years or 2000 years. And sometimes the, the, the range, the interval can, can go this, this far. So it doesn't give you much information. Uh, so that's why we didn't, uh, we didn't date this, uh, this, uh, this particular lineages. But that's why that's why we want to to do uh, uh, in this new project. I'm starting with uh, Professor Carl Skorecki. We want to do genome wide, meaning we want to study the whole genome, and then different parts of the genome can give you uh, some um, a more accurate uh, estimate of the times of the different times. 
um, so that's that's we are that's what we are waiting for when the whenever the funds arrive. Because my my assumed implication, and I, I might be wrong, is that you were saying that the uh, Ashkenazi people are descended of Sephardic ancestors. Can you know that for sure, or just that they have common ancestry somewhere? Well, it's very it's very uh, uncommon uh, if you, if we were talking uh, just uh, about a, a small part of the molecule, for instance, if we are just talking about the control region. Uh, it's a very hyper hyper variable region, but if we are talking about the coding region, uh, mutations are not so frequent. That means uh, they are not, uh, um, as we call, they are not. Uh, if if someone, uh, if an individual here has that specific mutation in the coding region, and someone else in in Poland, let's say has exactly the same sequence, exactly the same mutations. Uh, it, 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 uh, I mean, it could be random, but the probability is so low, it's so very low, that almost for sure, almost for sure, they do share uh, uh, a common uh, ancestor. And that's, what, uh, that's why I was telling in the beginning, in population genetics, we always talk about frequencies and about probabilities, which means, for instance, if I find someone with a particular lineage that is very frequent uh, in the Jews, for instance, in the Jews of Braganza, uh, that does not make you a Jew, because you can find that both in Jews and non-Jews. The, the, that's why you should always look at the population level, okay? Because we are talking about frequencies, we are talking about uh, probabilities. But uh, for instance, these 10 lineages that I was talking about, or the ones I showed, um, if they share exactly the same ones and the same variants, and some of them are very rare, I mean, you, you, you do not find these variants in anywhere, anywhere. So you have a very, very high prob probability that these two people are connected. Okay. Thank you. Before, before handing over to Ton, can I just uh, say to everyone uh, who's joining us on, on YouTube, you can ask your questions there and we'll put them to Ines. And Ali, I'm sorry that you, you didn't get the link, but uh, Ton. Yes. Um... I was wondering if you uh, will also make uh, uh, use of uh, the normal, the, the usual archival uh, uh, sources like Inquisition records, parochial uh, uh, birth, marriage, and death records. Uh, in other words, do genealogy to underscore your findings. Yes, of course. Uh, I, I work together with uh, with um, with historians and with people uh, working in genealogies. So the vast majority of these DNA samples I collected, uh, uh, the vast majority of these people do have already uh, their genealogy, and they can trace back to some, uh, for instance, to some uh, uh, inquisitional processes. Also. Um, for instance, in in a uh, in one of the villages here in in Braganza, very near Braganza, where I collected samples uh, called Kersão, um, we know that um, in the 17th century, this village had around 300 people, and 256 of these people have inquisitional processes. That gives you more than 50% of that village uh, has, has a Jewish, uh, Jewish origin. Besides that, people here know we are talking about very, very remote and, and small villages, and people here know exactly uh, where they come from. They know if they have Jewish ancestry or not. Um, so yes, I'm working together with, uh, with um, with historians, uh, specifically mm -hmm. with uh, Georges Martins and uh, and some other some uh, other people who work in, in genealogy, 
uh, to 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 contextualize the my work, of course. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Um, has there been any research into whether some surnames are more likely Jewish than others? Uh, actually, uh, Jorge Martins uh, has that work. Uh, he he just uh, published very recently a book, uh, but I'm afraid it's in Portuguese, so uh, it's not translated uh, into English. But he did uh, not. Uh, at least on, uh, about the the inquisitional processes that he studied so far, uh, he had. I can give you that uh, then the numbers. I do recall that, for instance, Lopes and Mendes were one of the most frequent. Um, but I can give you the numbers, uh, per, the precise percentages that he he found. It was published just uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, to 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 commemorate the the Memorial Day of the Inquisition yeah. uh, in Portugal on the 31 of March, and um, is that I, a book or an, or an article? Yes, it's a it's a it's a PDF file. I can I can um, I, I actually post it uh, on Facebook. You can uh, okay. You have all the numbers at the end. He had he did that study. He has all the the um, more frequent numbers. Uh, numbers, names, uh, also ages, uh, and also uh, males and females. He did all that study mm. uh, in the processes he, he studied so far. Okay, so, yeah. we can put that on sephardicgenealogy.com, right. David. Okay. Yeah, I actually posted already, but maybe people okay. didn't, uh, did I not it. Uh, <laughs> click the link because that uh, it will it will send you to a PDF file. We, yeah, we've had some questions about the DNA percentages in the commercial sort of DNA companies of Ancestry and, um, and, uh, and, and my heritage and so forth. Um, do, you, do you think those are anything more than entertainment or? Uh, I don't, I'm not sure I, I understand your question. The, you the, uh, if you take a DNA test with, say, Ancestry, they will tell you, uh, they will give you a percentage of your ancestry. Okay. Um, do you, is that just like, should we treat that as just entertainment or is there anything serious there? Uh, well, uh, that's, uh, that's a very good question. The thing is, um, as, I mean, uh, uh, those are companies and like any other company, they want to, to have profit and that's their job. And, and I'm fine with that. Yeah. But one thing is, is to have a company. Another thing is to do scientific research. Uh, meaning, um, I, I, I don't have the answers. I look for the answers. And sometimes they do the other thing, the other way around. They already know what they want to find. And then they feed the data to, to give them uh, mm. the answer they want. And when they say, for instance, um, and, I, and I, I, I get a lot of emails from people who, who did a genetic test and then uh, they, they ask for help to, to interpret uh, those results. And what happens is that, uh, for instance, they say, oh, but I'm sure I have, for instance, uh, people, uh, I just talked to one of them uh, last week. She was telling me, uh, she's from the Jewish community in Lisbon, and so she knows exactly where she comes from. She has all the genealogy, both uh, male side and female side. Uh, and, she, and she was very surprised because it appeared zero, zero percentage of Sephardic Iberian ancestry. Hmm. And said, how come? How can this happen? And I said, of course, because uh, when they compare your genetic uh, results to their database, and depending on what kind of algorithms they use, to do this this uh, this comparison, uh, basically it, it it has a lot to do with the kind of genetic database they use. If they don't have uh, a sufficient number of uh, Iberian Jews, obviously you're not going to find a match because just for the simple reason you don't have them in the database that you are comparing your sample with. So that's uh, that's why I really.
I think it's very important to to uh, to construct this this um, genetic database. Uh, we want to do with P Professor Carl Skorecki, because simply because in all these companies, for instance, the the genetic database. Some of the companies, I'm not gonna say the names because, uh, but I've been there and I know how they work and I know the the, the people who work there and everything. We had a few meetings, uh, and for instance. Uh, some of them, uh, they use as uh, a Sephardic reference population, uh, Jewish samples from, uh, from, uh, from Israel and from, uh, from the north of, uh, from north of Africa, and that's it. And obviously, uh, there are some connections, but it, it's a different demographic history that you have in the Jews from Iberia. So obviously, even if you have Iberian ancestry, if there are no Iberians in the databases, you, you will find zero connection. Zero because they don't exist in the databases. That's the, the question. And uh, what they call the Sephardic uh, reference, the vast majority don't have a single, a single sample uh, from Iberia. Or maybe they have one or two in some companies. But mm -hmm. some other companies don't at all have uh, Sephardic Iberian uh, Jewish samples. So, just uh, obviously, yeah. we'll not find anything. Um, if someone wants to do an uh, uh, anti DNA uh, test, what company would you uh, rec recommend? Well, uh, I would recommend uh, uh, Family Tree DNA. Uh, basically, because they have the biggest uh, genetic database, uh, they, they do have some uh, uh, Sephardic uh, samples, and um, and I think like um, uh, I don't know. For instance, some other companies claim uh, they give uh, results that I, I I just don't understand. How can they say such thing? Uh, I mean. One thing is marketing, it's fine. But how uh, with, uh, I, I would love to know how with the genetic data they can analyze, how can they assume uh, different stories? Uh, I call it, I call it uh, that's very romantic, but that's not science. Mm -hmm. So yeah. yes, uh, for someone who wants to do a genetic test, I would probably go for, uh, Either uh, family tree beyond DNA or or um, or my my heritage. But now I think I think it was my heritage. It was it changed. Uh, so it was uh, I think the company was very recently uh, sold to another group. So I'm not sure how how it's working now. So I would yeah. I, I would go for family tree. A basic question. Um, what can autosomal uh, DNA research tell you about Sephardic ancestry? Uh, well, we just, we studied very little thing about uh, autosomal uh, markers. As like here in this presentation, I just focused on the mitochondrial DNA and on, um, and on the Y chromosome. Uh, because the results we have in the uh, we just we just studied very um, a very low number of autosomic markers genetic markers. So basically, what we found was that there was there was um, a bias in the for instance uh, much more uh, much more uh, no much more men entering the, the Jewish community from outside, let's say, than women. Uh, mm -hmm. But we have very, very few genetic markers. So I wouldn't, we cannot, um, you know, we cannot conclude or we cannot say much. Uh, that's why we do want to, to study the, the, the complete genome. Because mm -hmm. the complete genome, uh, it's, it's a different story. It's a different. Uh, you have uh, you have all the data and uh, and very accurate data. 
So with that, you can say something. But if you study just a couple of genetic markers, you, you just can't say much. I mean, you can do like a, a, like some of these companies do. You know, you can do some uh, tell some uh, romantic tale, but uh, we don't do that kind mm -hmm. of, uh, of um, approach uh, in scientific research. Mm -hmm. So I would rather could that change? Yeah. Could that change in the future that autosomal could give you better results? about the past or is that an impossibility no it's not an impossibility it can also every every part of the genome well ideally ideally uh, the best thing is always to study as much genetic markers as you can because if, mm -hmm. if you as I, I as I said before different genetic um, compartments let's say of our genome they give you different information. And this information is complementary to, to, for instance, the Y chromosome can give you some kind of information. The mitochondrial will give you another kind of information. The X chromosome will give you a different kind of information. The autosomes will give you another type of information. So ideally, the best thing is if you can analyze everything, all the different uh, uh, genetic markers, so you can have uh, uh, the whole picture. Basically, you can have the whole picture and so be um, much more secure and much more accurate in, in, uh, in the, um, in the okay. insight you can take. Mm -hmm. And another basic question, if my heritage or another company says you have Iberian ethnicity, uh, is that indicative of Sephardic ancestry? Not necessarily, no. Mm -hmm. uh, as, I, as I pointed out before, uh, in, in population genetics, uh, and, and maybe it's a common mistake that uh, many people do, uh, is for instance, when I say that, uh, with an example, I think it's easier to understand. For instance, let's look at uh, lineage J1 uh, for the Y chromosome. Lineage, lineage, um, lineage J1 is very frequent in uh, Sephardic Jews from Iberia. It's, it reaches mm -hmm. very high frequencies. But, for instance, that does not necessarily mean that if you are, uh, if you have that lineage, that you are a Sephardic Jew from Iberia. Because you can also find this lineage spread spread in different, uh, in different um, parts of the Mediterranean area, for instance. Hmm. So uh, genetic, uh, uh, as I said before, uh, um, genetic cannot give you uh, a Jewish ID. And who, uh, saying Jewish or Catholic or Buddhist or whatever, they can only show you that you have, for instance, if, if, you, if you tell me, okay, I have this J1 lineage, but I also have the knowledge uh, by historical records, for instance, that probably my family came from Iberia. So you have to gather uh, all the information from different sources, not just genetics alone cannot tell you much. It can mm -hmm. tell you about the origin, of, uh, about the geographical origin of a particular lineage but not if you are Jewish or if you are something, whatever. That okay. You can't see that in genetics. In the archives of Bayonne and Amsterdam, we see people from Braganza coming in. Uh, are you also testing in Bayonne and Amsterdam? Sorry? To look if for I, this. Hmm? If Sorry? I tested anyone from, from Amsterdam. Yeah. No, I didn't. Mm -hmm. Actually, I, I just collect samples from the, those who stayed in either Braganza or in oh, Spain okay. near the border. I do not have um, samples from the diaspora communities. From uh, So you from, can't tell from your studies when people left from Braganza for Amsterdam or elsewhere? Now, for that, I would need to collect some samples in the mm -hmm. present-day 
uh, people that belong to, for yeah. instance, the, the, the Amsterdam community or mm -hmm. the Latvian community or in New York, uh, all the, the Portuguese um, community spread. Yes, in Amsterdam, you will not get very far with empty DNA, I think, because uh, Sephardic men in the 19th century more and more started to marry Ashkenazic women. And these went then to become, on to become a member of the Sephardic community. community. Right. If uh, Ashkenazic uh, uh, men married a Sephardic woman, then the right. woman went to the Ashkenazim. So, so that, that means that most Sephardic women, uh, most Sephardic empty DNA will be Ashkenazic. Uh, right. But that's the, uh, I mean, that's the beauty of studying uh, mitochondrial DNA and Y chromosome. Because you can mm -hmm. go back, it doesn't, it doesn't matter, for instance, if uh, if uh, a male from the fr from the Sephardic community in Amsterdam married an Ashkenazi woman, and if they mm. have a son, and if this son has another son, I can go mm. uh, back all the lineage back to Portugal, and it, yeah. it doesn't matter because because those two lineages are um, are more or less intact along the generations, mm. and the same with the mitochondrial DNA. You can also do that. So it doesn't matter if uh, yeah. in the autosomes it's different because in the yeah. autosomes yes you do have a mixture of mm -hmm. both um, of both uh, uh, genetic uh, heritages but if you're studying mitochondrial or the white chromosome it's you can go back thousands of years so it doesn't matter they do not mix so okay so for sure, I could find uh, some uh, some matches with uh, with the Jews here in Braganza. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. How many DNA samples did you test for your uh, for the study uh, that you presented uh, tonight? Yeah, one I presented just 60, 60 samples. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, that's why uh, uh, that's why we now want to enlarge the number of samples for around 200 uh, and basically these are the people who who stayed here and uh, you cannot go much further than because uh, otherwise you will lose the criteria because uh, I, I use a very uh, restrict criteria to collect my samples I mean, people mm -hmm. have to know uh, exactly uh, either they have all the genealogy uh, mm -hmm. back to, the, uh, to the, the inquisitional processes, or they are from one of these villages that we know that more than 50% of the people were uh, have Jewish uh, ancestry, um, and, and people who know themselves, they recognize themselves as, as Jewish descendants, and they are also recognized by their non-Jewish neighbors uh, as, as such, as Jewish descendants. But here, everybody knows everybody. So everybody knows exactly who has Jewish ancestry and who doesn't. Yes. So David, are there any questions on Facebook? Uh, yes, so some of them have already been uh, answered. Uh, Marisa makes an interesting point. She says that DNA science is up for interpretation because it's based on assumed cultural connections. So geneticists also have to have uh, cultural and historical uh, knowledge. And I, I, I think that's a good point. I seem to remember a few years ago, there was a uh, piece of research in Spain that suggested that 20% of the population were of Jewish origin because they had uh, forgotten about the uh, the Phoenicians and the Carthaginians and uh, so the Muslims of, of Jewish descent. But uh, Marisa also is asking, um, is uh, Sephardic origins uh, common amongst uh, people in Madeira and uh, the Azores? Is it so more or less common than in uh, the mainland of Portugal? Has, has that been tested? I do have some samples, uh, not from the Azores, 
uh, because uh, not because there there are not people there with uh, that might have uh, uh, Jewish ancestry, but just because I don't know anyone there and I don't have any contacts there. So basically, all the samples I collect, I know the people, uh, or uh, it's a friend of a friend of a friend. You know, it's. Uh, uh, it's all, uh, it's all, uh, and I do not uh, have anyone from uh, Azores, but I do know that uh, there were some uh, Jewish families there. But uh, as far as I know, probably from from Morocco, and rather recently, uh, also, I, I I have some from Madeira, uh, some samples from Madeira, but uh, I do believe that. The the um, well the majority as you saw in the map the majority of the crypto Jewish centers uh, were here in the mainland were basically in the northeast of Portugal and the center east of Portugal uh, even now you might find a family here and a family there in other regions in in Portugal but it's very difficult uh, because most of these people. Um, just lost uh, any kind of reference, any kind of connection. Uh, probably you have a lot of people uh, around, but they are just not aware of uh, their own uh, ancestry. They don't have that knowledge. They, mm -hmm. So that's uh, what what happens, I think. I mean, my, my, my own uh, YDNA um, is um, R1B1A, which you, you said is, is quite common. I think you said 28. Uh, yeah. percent. I mean, my, my assumption is, I, I, and it's possibly, it's certainly from Trazas Monches, I don't know if it's from Braganza, but um, my assumption is, is that means that that ancestor at some historic point um, converted to Judaism or, or, you know, had sex with a Jewish woman or, 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 or some such, but is, is it possible to say anything specific about that that particular um, sort of haplo group. Yes, I, I don't know exactly what uh, what what set of mutations you you tested, what kind of markers you did, but uh, Adam Brown is there, so uh, it's exactly the same uh, lineage. I don't know if it's no, Adam, Adam 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 was the person who 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 tested it, but I'm I'm just curious if you've got any. Uh, yeah, we do. We do have a lot of uh, uh, high pr percentage of that lineage uh, in our in our um, uh, Jewish group. Uh, probably this means that at some stage, because uh, this is very frequent, has very very high frequencies in in the general uh, Portuguese and Spanish population, and not just here, all along the Atlantic uh, fringe like uh, France, England, uh, in, in some magazines, this lineage, uh, not scientific magazines, but they call it the Celtic, the Celtic uh, gene or the Celtic uh, ID or something like that. Yeah. Um, so probably, yes, uh, some, at some stage, some of these men uh, were in, integrated in, in, uh, in the Jewish communities. Okay, I, I, Adam, you, you want to say something? I've, I've unmuted yeah, you. Yeah, sure. Hi, Inish. Hi. <laughs> Inish is a, a close collaborator of the Avatino Project and a gem. A gem. Please fund her. Okay. Um, <laughs> our finding is that uh, R1B is found in about 10% of the Ashkenazi population and in about 10% of the non Ashkenazi population. And there are two sources of R1B. One is R1B originates in the Middle East, okay? And so there's R1B that went into Western Europe and there's R1B that never went into Eastern Europe. You know, that was always part of the, the background noise of the Middle East genetically. So you can't judge just based on the R1B. But that being said, um, we don't see any evidence that more than maybe five or 6% of Sephardi non-Ashkenazi Y chromosomes come from with the R1B uh, lineage, which represents the vast majority of Western Europeans. Mm -hmm. And I want to make one other important point, which is that the R1B we are finding in the Jewish population, such as my own, entered the Jewish population at the end of Roman times. Okay, we're not seeing any R1B in the Ashkenazim or in the Sephardim that entered in the last 1500 years. 
that, 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 that's when people were, were, were Jews were actually um, proselytizing. Well, we don't think it was necessarily proselytizing. It really in the Roman in, in Roman times, you were allowed to have more than one deity to which to whom you prayed, and it was yeah. not unusual for people to pray to the God of Israel just like they prayed to the God of Braganza. Okay, and so for this population to have an affinity, don't forget, you know, the Jews were reasonably off, well off in the earliest times before the Visigoths got there, and they were they had yeah. land. And they were friendly with the gentry. And there's a very long story about the, the affinity that I'm sure Inish knows about, you know, about the things we know about from the prohibitions um, um, of Elvira, in which, they, in which the church officials uh, prohibited interaction, social interaction between Jews and Christians, which certainly suggests that there must have been interactions between Jews exactly. and Christians yes. if they went to the trouble of prohibiting it. Yes. So we have good reason to believe that there was flow into the Jewish population. We see it not just in uh, Spain, but in, in the Portuguese population. Clearly, there was something going on where the Romans never discouraged it. But once Christianity, once the wall went up between Christianity and Judaism, you know, once Christianity formed itself at the Synod of Nice and the Synod of Elvira, and the wall was put up, we don't see virtually any more integration into the Jewish community from the local populations. Okay. That's it. That's my 10 cents. Inish, thank you. That was really great. Thank you very much. Thank we you. can't wait to see the rest of your stuff. Okay. Yeah, me too. <laughs> um, Inish, can I just ask, I'm just curious um, about how local people react to their, their Jewish heritage, or is it just something uninteresting or important or just a fact of life or...? Uh, you, you have all kind of different uh, reactions. Uh, some people, uh, and I'm talking about people uh, well informed. I mean, some of them are physicians or are teachers in universities, for instance. Uh, that um, that said to me, uh, th they are good friends of mine, and I said, no way, I'm not gonna. Uh, I don't wanna. I know I don't wanna take part in this study. Uh, you know, and giving me uh, and telling me things like, uh, what is this? This is some kind of new census for the new inquisition or something. Uh, so you have all different kind of reactions. You also have people who are very proud and said, of course, I want to, I want to take part in this study because uh, uh, I know I do have this uh, Jewish ancestry and I'm very proud of this uh, Jewish ancestry. You also have those who are religious Catholics that go to church every Sunday, but still they said, of course, I will take part in your study because I'm, I'm Catholic, but I'm Jewish. Uh, so, and this duality uh, might seem very, very awkward and very strange for, for most of the people, but for us here, it's just a normal thing. It's just normal because mm -hmm. uh, uh, a lot of people do have you know, Jewish ancestry, but were raised as Catholics. Uh, and I think the vast majority right now are just not religious. Uh, they, they do, they are very interested in learning uh, about the Portuguese Jewish tradition, uh, but not exactly to, to return or convert or uh, in a more formal uh, religious or uh, way. And um, so you have all, all different kind of uh, reactions. Uh, but still, still people are not um, uh, some, and you have a, a, a high percentage of people who are not very uh, happy to talk publicly uh, that they do have Jewish ancestry. They might talk to me privately, but uh, if they don't know you, uh, they will not talk about their ancestry. They are, most of the people here are still very, um, very cautious, let's say, with, uh, with that subject. Okay, because I think the president said he had Jewish ancestry. Did he uh, know? Maybe, it's probable. <laughs> you have I suppose everybody in Portugal probably somewhere has. Right? Yeah, in, in some, uh, uh, yeah, probably. Yeah. 
uh, it could be, but still here, I mean, I'm talking about the, the, the small villages. Yeah. Uh, some of the people are not, uh, well, you have, uh, as I said, you have all different kind of reactions. Some are very proud. Uh, and I, I um, when I did this study, I went back to all these villages and I gave it one of them uh, kind of a certificate with the story of, uh, of their own lineage. Uh, and they were very happy. I did presentations in all these small villages and, uh, and, um, and they were very happy and very proud and everything. And, uh, but still, some uh, do not like to, to talk about it uh, in front of uh, strangers, let's say, in front of people they don't know or they don't trust. Yeah. So it's not so, uh, you have all different kind of, <laughs> of um, reactions, yes. Right, Tom. Um... No, they are not new questions. Uh, Bernard Miller uh, maybe wants to ask something about the Duke of Braganza and the Jews. Hi, Ines. Yes, thank you for a really fascinating and clear explanation about how the actual genetic descent process works. I think it's one of the best I've seen. I just had a very specific question. Um, which is uh, a lot of people um, who claim Jewish ancestors also claim descent from the Duke of Braganza. And I wondered whether or not you'd found any evidence of mixing between the family of the Duke of Braganza and Jews in your genetic studies. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you, first of all, and thank you for your question. Uh, actually, the, the Duke of Braganza is not from Braganza. The family is not from here, uh, originally. Uh, I'm, I don't know, I've never heard about any connection, but that doesn't mean it, it does not exist. Uh, that, uh, I'm afraid someone, uh, some historian would be uh, better to, to answer your question. But just uh, as far as I know, well, I do know that the, the, the Duke of Braganza, the Braganza dynasty, uh, has nothing to do with, with the town of Braganza. They are not from the northeast of Portugal. They are from uh, somewhere in Alentejo, I, I, I believe. Um, and as far as I know, I, I've never heard about any any connection. But But maybe, but maybe there is one. Someone I don't know if uh, I mean, in uh, some histor historian that uh, is here maybe uh, could could answer you more accurately. Thank you for that. It was actually from some people in Israel who were making the claim, and I don't have any evidence of what they were basing it on. But I just thought I would pose the question. But thank you for that bit of background information as well. Yeah, well, uh, uh, usually what I do when I have this this kind of question uh, is I, I, I just call George Martins, <laughs> which is one of the best historians uh, in, in Portugal about the Jewish population in Portugal. And, uh, and I, I, I ask him. Uh, and if he doesn't know, in, in a couple of days he will find out. So I will ask him. And when I have an answer, uh, I'll get back to you. Thanks. So time to wrap up, I think, David. Okay. Um, thank, thank you, thank you, Inez, so much. And um, just, just, just to give you another plug. Um, she, she needs finance. So uh, if, if anyone can uh, sponsor the research, so somebody, somebody actually suggested uh, crowdfunding, which is uh, perhaps an idea. But um, yes, I, I thought of that also. And um, but the point is. Uh, I couldn't find, I don't know if, if there is a crowdfunding for science in Europe. All the ones I found uh, are basically uh, American and they just work for researching uh, researchers working in the United States, not in Europe or Israel. So uh, I don't know, but that's a possibility. I, I thought of that too. Thank you.
Okay, well, if, if anybody um, wants to, uh, to finance the research or knows anyone who can finance the research, they can get uh, in touch with Ines or, 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 or through Ton and, and myself. Um, so th thank you, thank you so much. Um, next week, uh, we have uh, Daniel Smith Ramos, who will be discussing the uh, Spanish archives uh, pre-1750. Um, I mean, more or less, all, all we look at is, is Inquisition archives, and there's a huge amount in the, uh, in the church archives, in the secular archives, and uh, elsewhere. So we look forward uh, to that meeting. And um, no, just thank, thank you so much, because it's a really interesting subject. And I think, um, you know, as, as somebody working in genealogy, so many family lines just lead back precisely to the area you are looking at. And so I'm, I'm waiting to see a, uh, a direct genetic link to, to, to a long lost cousin yeah. of mine. Um, that, would be, that would be very interesting. And I'm sure, I'm sure we can find, I'm sure we can find a genetic link. Yeah, I'm sure. Uh, so, Ton, would you like to? Uh... Yes. Um, thank you, Ines, for a um, wonderful talk. And uh, um, hope to see you again sometime here. Thank you to all our viewers tonight. And thank you to our patrons who make this work possible. And uh, we hope to see you all next week. Tune in. And uh, see you.